Hello and welcome to the review of chapter 26 of Guyton and Hall's Medical Physiology textbook. In this chapter we'll be going over the basics of the urinary system, talking about the anatomy and then also a little bit about its role in the body. If you enjoy this video please don't forget to give it a like and subscribe to the channel as it helps us out greatly. If you're in need of the textbook there is an affiliate link within the description. So it starts off just talking about the basic function of the kidneys, really with its real function being to remove the waste materials of the body and control the volume volume and electrolyte composition of body fluids. But it does have multiple other functions which we will also get into in the following chapters. But just to give a brief overview, the list of its functions include excretion of metabolic waste products as we talked about as well as the regulation of water and electrolyte balances. But it also functions to regulate body fluid osmolality and electrolyte concentrations. In addition, it also does regulation of arterial pressure, of the acid base balance, of urethrocyte production, urethrocytes being the red blood cells, and then also has some functions in the secretion, metabolism, and excretion of hormones in addition to gluconeogenesis, so the production of glucose. So if we dive into each of those a little bit further, it excretes the waste products, including urea, which is a byproduct of the metabolism of amino acids. It excretes creatinine, which is from muscle creatine, so a byproduct of muscle energy production. We have uric acid from nucleic acid, Acids. and then we have the end products of hemoglobin breakdown and also from hormones as well. It regulates water and electrolyte balances as one of its main functions and then it regulates arterial pressure both in the long term through the regulation of how much sodium and water is within the body but then also short term through the activation of the RAS system or the renin angiotensin aldosterone system which has a, a immediate effect of causing vasoconstriction and more short-term control of arterial pressure. It controls acid base balance by having some buffer stores so it's, it plays a major role in the long-term regulation of acid base balance as we talked about regulation of erythrocyte production so it secretes a hormone called erythropoietin in hypoxic states to then tell the bone marrow to produce more red blood cells so then you can carry more oxygen it also has a role in calcium homeostasis where it converts vitamin d into the active form of calcitriol which then tells the body to absorb more calcium calcium in the GI tract and then also reabsorb more calcium from the bone. And then it also has a role in glucose synthesis. So it can convert amino acids into glucose via gluconeogenesis if the body is in need. So if we talk about the basic anatomy of the kidney, it is shown here in figure 26.2, where if we go from the outer side to the inner side, we have the capsule, which encapsulates the kidney and is one of the one organs that is, actually has a capsule on it. And then we have the renal cortex on the next phase in, followed by the renal medulla, which is where the concentrating ability of your urine is set. And then you also have your renal pelvis. And then your renal pelvis, this is where all your urine is collected to then go out your ureter. We then also have these major calyxes, which are preceded by minor calyxes, which once again is just the entry into the renal pelvis. If we break down the kidney even further and into its functional unit, you can see that slightly outlined here, shown by this nephron. So a nephron is a functional unit of the kidney and it cannot be regenerated in kidney disease. So if you do have kidney disease and a loss of nephrons, the goal is really to stop that loss of nephrons as much as possible because you cannot get them back. So if we go into exactly what the nephron looks like, we can see that on this figure here, where we have a, a nephron which starts off with the glomerulus, uh, which has the Bowman's capsule, which encapsulates the glomerulus, which is this collection of blood vessels, which is where the blood is filtered into the proximal tubule, which then dives down into the loop of Henle, which dips into the medulla and provides the concentrating ability. And then we continue on in the distal tubule into the collecting duct. So as blood is filtered and we have that filtrate passing through the nephron, we have the reabsorption of substances and then also the secretion of substances into the tubule to eventually end up with urine. So our waste products obviously will not get reabsorbed and then depending 
on the acid base balance or other factors other substances may be secreted into the urine whilst other more important molecules such as sodium will get reabsorbed on its path just depending on what the body's need is we have two types of nephrons here one which is called the cortical nephron which sits mainly within the cortex as you can see here and it has its own peritubular blood supply and then we have the juxtomedullary nephron which means that it's got this large portion within the medulla so this loop of Henle really dips down into the medulla and then the blood supply is slightly different where it has this vasa recta which we will get to in the following chapters. Now the importance of the juxta medullary nephron is that it is able to highly concentrate the urine so you see a lot more of these nephrons in say desert dwelling animals which need to concentrate the urine because their water intake is more sparse. So then once that urine has been produced it goes down the collecting duct to then go go through the ureters into the bladder and then the bladder obviously stores our urine until we have a convenient time to be able to excrete the urine and the process of actually emptying the bladder is called micturition so urination the fancy scientific word is micturition and to understand that we have to understand the different muscles that are present within the bladder so our first one is the detrusor muscle the detrusor muscle is the muscle that wraps around the entire bladder itself and it is not under voluntary control and that muscle is what contracts to actually squeeze the bladder and empty the bladder you then have the internal sphincter which is also not under voluntary control and its role is to contract and stop urine from leaking out of the bladder as it's filling so that is a passive way of keeping the bladder from continuously le leaking urine and then the last muscle that we need to know is the external sphincter and that is the one that is under voluntary control so that is what is clamped off if you have the urge to urinate but you don't urinate at that time it's because the external sphincter is contracting preventing the detrusor muscle from squeezing up urine out so what happens here is that as the bladder fills with urine, the pressure within the bladder increases. And once the pressure reaches a certain point, that will be sensed by the parasympathetic nervous supply via the pelvic nerves, which come from S2 to S4 segments. We will get to these segments in the neurological unit, but just follow along with me here. So via the pelvic nerve, which is a parasympathetic nervous supply, it gets sensed and instantly turns into a reflexive arc. So it doesn't get sent up the spinal cord, it just does a reflexive arc and then goes back to the detrusor muscle to then tell the muscle to contract. So the increased pressure in the bladder gets sensed, telling the bladder to now contract. The bladder contracts and we have a further increase in pressure and if the bladder doesn't empty because of constriction of the external sphincter, then eventually the bladder will essentially tire and then it will relax, allowing a greater volume of urine to fill the bladder so it will get even bigger. So that's really shown here in this figure 26.8 where we have all these contractions relaxed down and as that's occurring, the volume is getting greater and greater and our pressure is slightly increasing until we get to a point where even further increases in volume result and a greater pressure within the bladder so then these contractions become more frequent and more prevalent and then that signal of a higher pressure because of such a large volume within your body will then get sent up to your higher centers within your brain telling you that you have an urge to go and urinate so then you'll really need to try and find a spot to empty your bladder and then when that time comes then your higher senses will then send a voluntary impulse through your pudendal nerve, which is a voluntary control to relax your external sphincter. Now you need to, at the same time as relaxing your external sphincter, you also obviously need to contract your detrusor muscle. So if one of these natural micturition contractions aren't occurring at the time that you need to go, the body responds by contracting your abdominal muscles, which increases the pressure within your abdomen, thus increasing the pressure relatively around your bladder, which is sensed by your parasympathetic supply to then tell your detrusor muscle to contract. 
So you're able to voluntarily get your detrusor muscle to contract indirectly by increasing your abdominal pressure. So then our detrusor contracts at the same time that our external sphincter relaxes and your bladder empties. Now we do have a sympathetic supply here as well, which comes via the hypogastric nerve, which comes from your thoracolumbar region. Now, you don't necessarily have to know that the thoracolumbar region right now, but that will be touched on, as I said, in the neurological unit. But the sympathetic supply mainly has a role in terms of the blood vessels, innervating the blood vessels of the bladder, but then also have a sensory component to be able to sense that the bladder is full, in addition to also feeling pain, so if you have some kind of inflammation of your bladder. Now, if we talk about the ureters, the ureters themselves have peristaltic contractions, which means that there's a wave of contraction that occurs Occurs, directing blood down the ureter into the bladder and that gets stimulated by parasympathetic stimulation and then inhibited by sympathetic stimulation and then there are some reflexes that can occur if there is a abnormal pathology so for instance the ureters where they empty into the bladder, usually when the bladder contracts, they're located so that when the bladder contracts, the opening closes. So then no urine will get propelled through the ureter as the bladder is trying to empty. But if there is a abnormal location of the ureter opening, then you can have a vesico-ureter reflex where contraction of the bladder results in urine emptying into the ureter as well as going through the urethra. And then when it comes to pain, if if there is a constriction of the ureter, say from a stone, then there will be a powerful sympathetic reflex back to the kidney, which will be one sensed as severe pain, and then also resulting in constriction of our renal arterial, so then our urine output dramatically reduces, so then we don't get a massive production of urine through a ureter that's blocked, and that's called a ureto-renal reflex. Now we've already talked about the micturition reflex here, which is the process by which an increased pressure within the bladder gets sensed by the parasympathetic nervous system and does a reflexive arc that you may not necessarily sense within the higher senses initially, and that causes an increased contraction within the bladder, and if there's no emptying, then it will then relax, allowing more filling of the bladder until the bladder is so full that the signal actually does get sensed by the higher senses, also through the sympathetic supply via the hypogastric nerve so then you're able to sense that your bladder is full your brain then tells your patindal nerve to relax your external sphincter at the same time as contracting your detrusor muscle so then your detrusor muscle is able to empty your bladder and if it's not in an active contraction at that time you'll tell it to contract by increasing your intra-abdominal pressure through abdominal contraction now we do have some abnormalities of micturition. So for instance, if your sacral region is damaged, so you've damaged to those sacral nerves, then you interrupt that reflex arc. So now that that reflex arc is inhibited, as soon as your bladder fills with some urine, then you do not sense that through the parasympathetic nervous system. So then there is no reflexive constriction of your detrusor muscle. So your detrusor muscle effectively becomes ineffective. So you no longer have detrusor muscle working as soon as the bladder starts to fill with some volume and the pressure increases. So now the bladder will continually fill until it gets so full that it starts to overflow and just leak through that constricted external sphincter and then you get overflow incontinence meaning that there's just a, a leak of urine through your bladder because it's just purely too full however if you have a damage to your spinal cord that's further up so you still have your sacral region then your reflexive arcs is still present so then as soon as the bladder fills then you're going to be able to have your detrusor muscle contract and that will continue, but you no longer have control of your urination because you can't actually tell your pudendal nerve to relax your external sphincter. And then if you actually have damage to your inhibitory side of things, so then your external sphincter is always relaxed, then you're actually going to have constant urination every time that the bladder fills, the detrusor muscle contracts, and it's instantly going to flow out. So then lastly here, we talk about how the kidney actually produces urine. And the best diagram here for this is figure 2610. And what this is saying is that for each component or each molecule that gets filtered or that passes into the kidneys, it has its own independent method of either getting reabsorbed or getting secreted or not having any of those being performed. So then the kidney is able to specifically determine how much of each molecule will leave the body in urine. So for instance, if it is a waste product, 
and you don't want to reabsorb it, then you will only have filtration of that substance that will go straight out as urine. If it's a substance that we want some reabsorption, so we want to regulate how much we actually excrete, then we're going to have some reabsorption. So it'll get filtered, some will get excreted as urine, but we'll reabsorb some depending on how much we need in the body. If it's a substance that we definitely need and we don't want to get rid of any of it, then we have filtration with complete reabsorption. But then if we have a substance which we need to get rid of more of it over top of what's filtered, then we can also have secretion. So we have an even enlarged amount of that molecule being secreted as urine. So an example of each of these, so filtration only, that's for something such as creatinine, that just gets filtered and goes straight out. Filtration with partial reabsorption includes sodium, so we want to be able to regulate how much sodium we have. Filtration with complete reabsorption includes, you know, amino acids, glucoses, we don't want to get rid of those in our urine. And then filtration with secretion, that includes our acid-base balance, so that includes hydrogen ions. So if we have an acidotic state, we're going to excrete more hydrogen ions. And then that's really a good example of how the kidneys regulate our waste products and also make sure we don't lose too much of the good stuff. So the kidney has a high GFR, which means that it filters a lot of substances, including all the substances that we want to keep, because it allows the kidney to actually get rid of a lot of waste products fast. We don't have to fluff around trying to only get rid of the waste products at this region. Instead, if we get rid of absolutely everything and then quickly reabsorb what we need, we can get rid of a lot of waste products fast. And then that also allows a lot of blood supply to come through the kidney constantly and we have rapid turnover of the blood supply. So we're actually going to see that blood multiple times. So instead of just only selectively filtering certain substances at this level, we filter everything, reabsorb what we need, and then secrete what we don't need. And that really summarizes our chapter for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Feel free to drop a comment. Otherwise, we'll see you in the next video.